Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Provincial Stroke Rounds. My name is Jean Morrow, and I'm the Regional Education Coordinator with the Southeastern Toronto Stroke Network, based out of St. Mike's Hospital Unity Health. The Provincial Stroke Rounds Committee and myself are pleased to host these rounds on behalf of the Southwestern Ontario Stroke Network. Today's presentation is titled Update on the Management of Cerebral Venous Thrombus, CVT, a Multidisciplinary Approach, presented by Dr. Manzia. There are no handouts for today's presentation. This webcast will be recorded and archived and can be accessed through the link provided in the follow-up email that you will receive. Please keep your microphone muted during the presentation and do remember that the views expressed today are those of our presenter. An interactive component will be held during the last 10 to 15 minutes when we have a question and answer period and hope to hear from as many participants as possible. Please, at that time, type, type your questions into the uh, chat or Q&A section. I encourage you to take a moment to complete the evaluation for today's event by either scanning the QR code uh, seen here, which will also uh, show again at the end, um, or through a link that we're gonna put into the chat at the end of the session. Certificates of attendance were attached in the email invite. Please feel free to fill in your name and keep it for future reference. Before introducing our speaker, um, just wanted to mention that the Provincial Stroke Rounds uh, Committee did mitigate bias uh, in the planning and the review of the slides for today's event. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Jennifer Manzia, is a stroke neurologist and associate professor in the Department of Clinical Neurosciences at Western University in London, Ontario. She is the medical director of the Southwestern Ontario Stroke Program and London Health Sciences Stroke Program. She completed her PhD in neurosciences at the University of Toronto under the supervision of Dr. Sandra Black before enrolling in medical school at the University of Ottawa. In 2012, she completed her neurology residency training at Western University followed by a one-year stroke fellowship at the University of Calgary Stroke Program. Dr. Manzia is the director of the Stroke Fellowship Program at Western University. Since 2018, she's been a board member of the Canadian Stroke Consortium, and her research interests include cognitive impairment following stroke, primary CNS vasculitis and its mimics, and young stroke. Dr. Manzia is co-chair with Dr. Thalia Field of the inaugural Canadian Stroke Best Practice Guidelines on Cerebral Venous Thrombus. Take it away, Jen. So thanks, Jean. So these are my uh, disclosures and thank you for inviting me today to represent the Southwestern Stroke Network. So I'm gonna start um, with a case and I want you to, um, these are my objectives. So the, the case that I'm going to present is a real case that I was involved with recently, and I'm going to have a question, and I just want you to put your answer in the chat. So this is a 73-year-old uh, woman. She was presented to the emergency department with headache and profound whole body weakness and numbness associated with nausea and vomiting. This is her past medical history. Uh, things to note is that she had a history of pulmonary embolism, which was, and she was anticoagulated for that in 1988 and actually had a recent uh, PE and was anticoagulated for three months, but this was felt to be provoked because it occurred at the time of immobilization for a recurrent small bowel obstruction. At the time, we didn't have a lot of information, but there was a potential diagnosis of giant cell arteritis um, she'd also been worked up for cancer because she had a pulmonary lung nodule. These were her medications. When she was assessed by my colleague or the resident at the time, these are her vitals. She was um, Persian and Farsi speaking, but according to her daughter, she had normal speech and language. She had a left gaze preference. Uh, visual fields appear to be normal. Um, I don't believe the fundi were, were examined at the time, and that will... I'll tell you why that's relevant, uh, relevant in the presentation. Risk reflexes bilaterally upgoing toes. And you can see she's profoundly weak uh, bilaterally in both the upper and lower extremity. So this is her imaging um, that was done. So you can see two areas. This is a plain CT, two areas of uh, hypo or hyperdensity um, in the left frontal and the medial sort of frontal parietal region consistent with 
intracranial hemorrhage, as well as edema surrounding these areas of hemorrhage. At the time, the physicians, the eMERGE docs were not thinking that this was venous sinus thrombosis. They were thinking maybe this is stroke, but they still did a CTEA head and neck. And this is a reasonable way to diagnose CVT, but you want to weight it towards the venous system. But you can see there's multiple areas of abnormality. So she had thrombus in her right jugular vein, also in the sigmoid sinus, extending into the transverse and extensive thrombus seen in the superior sagittal sinus, and also thrombus in her cortical veins. In the emergency department, she had a focal seizure with right hand clonic mu movements for a few minutes that self-resolved, and then she was more confused and drowsy. So here's the first question. How would you manage this patient? She has extensive cerebral venous thrombosis. So these are your choices. Would you treat her with full dose anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin? Would you treat her with full dose anticoagulation with unfractionated heparin with a bolus? Would you treat her with full dose anticoagulation, low molecular heparin, consult neurosurgery and interventional radiology? Would you treat her with a DOAC? Um, or would you not treat with anticoagulation given the intracranial hemorrhage and consult neurosurgery and interventional radiology. So I'll give you a few minutes to put your answer. And again, there may be multiple, multiple choices. I see my fellows are participating. We'll give it a few more minutes. Okay, so we have ones, threes, and fives. So um, the next morning, I, I come on to call, so I'm taking over for my colleague. I go see her, and initially she's speaking, but rapidly becomes drowsy, not, and then basically not moving just wiggling her toes, followed by incomprehensible sounds, moaning, lip smacking, roving eyes, uh, and then proceeds to just be able to withdraw to pain and no, no movement in all four limbs. Her GCS is nine. And this is her scan. Uh, this is done later in the afternoon. Uh, we are worried about seizures, so we're able to actually get a continuous EEG. And the reason why you see this is all artifact these sort of the leads, those are the EEG leads. And you can see that there's worsening edema. The hemorrhage looks stable. We also did look at the, the uh, vessels again and the clot seemed to be stable. It hadn't progressed. So what is cerebral venous thrombosis? So cerebral venous thrombosis is just defined as thrombosis of the veins of the brain. And this can include the dural venous sinuses and or the cortical or deep veins. And this does not include extracranial and end organ thrombosis. So we don't consider retinal vein as a cerebral venous thrombosis or an isolated jugular vein thrombosis or spinous venous plexus is not included. And this is just a sort of cartoon anatomy showing you uh, the venous system and also to always remember about the cortical veins because they can also cause um, symptoms and problems. So. CVT is actually a rare, considered a rare cause of stroke. It's much more common in children and young adults, and it's three times more common in women versus men, and it often affects women of childbearing years. So this is unique because it is a disease of a more young stroke population. Typically, prognosis is excellent, but it's not 100% excellent, meaning that everybody recovers from this. So you can see that at least in one of the larger studies, about 20%, so 80% recovered, but still 20% had an MRS of two to six. Mortality was around 
In a more recent study, the MRS was 15.6 for an MRS three to six, and mortality was slightly lower. So there's a variation of mortality um, in which, depending on which study you look at. So what is the pathophysiology? So it's a unique disease because you not only get ischemic stroke, but you also get hemorrhage. So you get venous congestion, which causes increased venous pressure. You can get vasogenic edema from breakdown of the blood brain barrier. Sometimes this can be reversible. You also get cytotoxic edema, which can lead to infarct, sometimes reversible. You can see small infarcts resolving. And also because of this buildup of pressure, you get intracranial hemorrhage. And because of these symptoms, you get focal neurologic deficits, seizures. And then also from the venous hypertension, you get reduced CSF resorption, and this is transmitted to the optic nerve sheet and the, to the optic nerves and you get papilledema. So with that, symptoms are the headache, decreased level of consciousness and coma. So this is just sort of a recap of the pathology um, from the, what happens to increase capillary pressure, reduce cerebral perfusion pressure, disruption of the blood brain barrier, reduce cerebral perfusion, cytotoxic edema, which can cause stroke, and then hemorrhagic infarction. So presentation is can be difficult because it sometimes people just present with a headache. So that's probably the most common symptom. So a patient with a new headache, sometimes you know young women attributed to be a migraine, but new headache in a women on the OCP, you always want to consider this in your diagnosis. Seizures and probably focal neurologic symptoms are the next most common. And this will also depend on which sinus is affected or which vein, if it's a cortical vein thrombosis, you can sometimes have different system, different symptoms. Why I put eyes is because anybody with a headache and papilledema, you should always consider um, venous sinus thrombosis. And we don't always look at the eyes to look for optic disc swelling. Sometimes it's very subtle and it can just be diplopia or slight ocular misalignment. And in some very more severe cases or if the deep cerebral veins are affected, you can get decreased level of consciousness and some patients can present with coma. So what are the causes? At least 20% of patients, we do not actually find a cause. Sometimes it's more that someone may have one or more risk factors and that's simply what the etiology of the CVT is. So in terms of patient characteristics, as I said, it's more common in females and in younger females and less frequent in male. Probably one of the most common is oral contraceptives, pregnancy. Re less common is hereditary thrombophilia. Again, you have to, it depends on which series you look at. Obesity, something called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. You can also get it with infections, active malignancy. Less common, hormone replacement therapy, other systemic disease, dehydration, and sometimes we actually cause it through a neurosurgical operation or a catheterization of the jugular. And you can also see it in head trauma. So patient who had a bad car accident will find that they have a CVT. So what is the evidence for acute anticoagulation? So of course, when you see the scan that I showed you, um, it's not um, it's not, it's normal to feel, uh, um, um, to feel uncomfortable to anticoagulate that patient with hemorrhage, right? That's a very normal feeling, but the goal is to prevent progression of the thrombus. And if you remember what I said about the, uh, pathophysiology, the reason why you are getting hemorrhage is because of this buildup of pr pressure. So you want to prevent progression of the thrombus and you want to alter the balance between thrombosis and lysis of the clot. So what do the guidelines say? Most, at least the big guidelines say that you do treat patients with heparin, even in patients with intracranial hemorrhage. And the evidence for this is strong, but the, the sort of quality is moderate. And how about low molecular weight over unfractionated heparin? This is a weak recommendation, um, but the European Stroke Organization does recommend low molecular weight over unfractionated heparin. And this is based largely on the evidence of, from DVT that low molecular weight heparin is a preferable agent in terms of sort of steady flow, less ebbs and flows and peaks. 
and felt to be safer in general. Unfractionated heparin can be considered when you're planning for a surgical procedure. Some of these patients may need an EVD or they may actually need a decompressive hemicraniectomy. So if you feel that your patient is um, going towards that, uh, you may consider unfractionated heparin. And then patients with severe renal dysfunction. Uh, one thing that often comes up and we discuss among neurologists, whether a bolus should be used. Most, pay, most guidelines would recommend a bolus for local protocols just because it's going to take too long to get to steady state. If you talk to hematology, you know, that's what they would advise. So is there evidence for unfractionated heparin versus low molecular weight heparin? There is, um, a, you know, meta-analysis, systematic review looking at this question. There isn't a lot of evidence about this question. They're, you know, based on you know, three trials with a small number of patients. So 179 that got low molecular weight heparin, 372 that got unfractionated heparin. So what they found was there was a trend for mortality if you received low molecular weight he heparin. So there was lower mortality for low molecular weight heparin versus unfractionated heparin. For functional outcome, there was a trend so no significant increase in the odds of a good functional rec recovery associated with mo low molecular weight uh, heparin. Intracranial inc uh, hemorrhage, no significant increase in the odds of extracranial hemorrhage associated with low molecular weight use. So not a lot of evidence to guide us, but this is what we have. And I don't think we're going to have other trials to guide us. So what about... Um, opening up the vessel. So if we are able to recanalize uh, the vessels that are involved, does that affect outcome? So one study that looked at this question is called Priority CBT, and this is a multi-center perspective study between 214 to 218, and they wanted to assess imaging and blood biomarkers to identify patients with CBT who were more likely to experience uh, progression. Uh, for instance, venous infarction. And their primary outcome was looking at rate of early recanalization. So that was at day eight, and also evolution of brain parenchymal lesions using MRI and MRV. And they were looking at improvement in lesions such as a non-hemorrhagic lesion or worsening and new or enlarged hemorrhagic lesion. Their secondary outcomes were looking at headache, as you know, that's pretty common. And they also looked at functional outcome. So what is quite interesting uh, from this study, uh, which, which is quite relevant to practice and, you know, when do you follow up people with CBT on imaging, is that a large proportion of patients actually recanalize quite early, so 74%, and some may have just a complete, less likely to have complete, but most, you know, 68% had partial. And if you look at three months, you get a few more, so 41% partial and 54 full recanalization at three months. And early recanalization was associated with improvement of non-hemorrhagic lesions and lower risk of worsening, but there was no effect on hemorrhage. Um, so this is you know, also relevant when we're gonna talk about more um, aggressive procedures to open up the sinuses. And there was also a trend in the multivariate analysis for a favorable functional outcome at day eight with early recanalization, but there was actually no significant differences for headache at early or late follow-up. So we talked about acute anticoagulation um, and what you know is recommended and what we do. What do we do in patients like the patient I showed you? Um, is there other options and patients who have a very severe presentation um, with poor prognostic signs like she had, which were, you know, coma, hemorrhage, other poor prognostic signs are involvement of the deep cerebral veins. So there was many studies before this study, which was look, which looked at thrombolysis or anticoagulation for cerebral venous thrombosis. So this also involved interventional procedures like similar to procedures that we use uh, for acute ischemic stroke where we go and we try to pull out the blood clot. Also just to remember that the sinuses and veins are very different than the arteries and people have a lot less experience treating uh, this condition than 
uh, ischemic stroke with EBT. So this question wanted to answer um, whether there was a population of patients who could benefit from an intervention like this, because previous studies had been small case series, which are fraught with bias. So this was a randomized control style. It was open label with blinded assessors for functional outcome, intention to treat. And what they were looking at was local IV thrombolysis, which means thrombolysis that was administered locally to the clot plus interventional treatment versus standard of care versus standard of care, which all patients involved, uh, also all patients received anticoagulation. So every patient needed anti received anticoagulation. So this was a study that unfortunately was um, stopped early because they couldn't uh, recruit. Um, so in the end, there were 67 patients that were recruited from eight hospitals, one of, one of those factors that I discussed about poor outcome, they had to be randomized within 10 days of CVT. So the outcomes they were looking at were an excellent outcome, because remember a lot of these patients are young patients and you know we it's maybe not as acceptable to have an MRS of two or three in someone younger. Um, so they were looking at MRS of zero to one at 12 months. And then the secondary outcome was MRS of zero to one at six months and 12 months. And then they looked at recanalization and surgical interventions, with me, which meant the patients had to go for a decompressive hemicraniectomy, have an EDD. Their safety outcome was major hemorrhagic complications uh, with symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage within one week of randomization and all cause mortality at six and 12 months. So this was a non-significant or study, unfortunately. So their primary and secondary endpoints um, did not meet significance. If you look at the MRS, um, the grata bars here, you see uh, the distribution uh, um, breakdown between an MRS of zero to one and um, in both standard of care and endovascular treatment. In terms of safety, this was non-significant, but at 12 months, um, there were actually more deaths in the EBT and standard care group. Uh, and none of these reached significance except seizures and for serious adverse events. Some of the uh, potential adverse events that can occur with this treatment is you can perforate the venous system. Um, and then decompressive hemi hemicraniectomy did not seem to be statistically uh, different between it. Again, you need to remember that this study was unfortunately under underpowered, but it was not a positive study. So where do we go from here? Uh, so we need to evaluate each patient on a case by case on a case by case with, and we need to consult and work as a multidisciplinary team. You want to work with a, your neurointerventionist, and you want to work with someone who has done this procedure before. It's not a common procedure. You know, I, I think I've maybe been involved in one or two cases in my career, so it's it's pretty rare. We don't do this frequently um, because we don't have, you know, strong evidence uh, to recommend this as a standard of care for all patients. And who do we consider it for? And I think this is where it can be quite tricky. You know, is it in patients who have these poor prognostic signs? Are there patients who did deteriorate clinically rapidly or have worsening of their imaging? And the question is, how long do you wait for the anticoagulation to work? And I don't think we know that, right? In, in this study, I couldn't actually find when the patients underwent the procedure. They had to undergo the procedure within 10 days, but I couldn't find the mean time from onset to uh, procedure. Again, because it's something that we do not do routinely, you want it, someone who does it, who's experienced. And I think the last thing to remember, there still may be people who benefit, but you know, we're not, it's not entirely clear who, who, should, who will benefit from this. So as you saw in our patient, um, she was having seizures. We did record seizures. So seizures as a presenting symptom in ischemic stroke is, is rare or, you know, probably 10%, 10 to 12%, but this is much more common in patients presenting with CBT. So in one of a large prospective uh, study, 34% of patients with CBT had a seizure within seven days of diagnosis and the majority occurred early. What are the risk factors? So if you have 
um, brain swelling, hemorrhage, certain areas of or certain certain veins affected. So the cortical vein or the superior sagittal sinus. If you have edema, infarct, those are risk factors. If you're presenting with focal neurologic signs, which likely go with the findings I was discussing on, on imaging. And then for some reason, females, and what I say about female specific risk factors, meaning if they're on the oral contraceptive pill, if they're pregnant, seem to be a risk factors for acute seizures. And this study also looked at outcome and they actually did not find any difference in functional outcome after adjusting for the poor prognostic factors, which I uh, talked to you about at 12 months. So what do we do in patients who are seizing? And this comes up often with ischemic stroke. So at least from a prophylactic point of view, we don't prophylactically treat patients with seizures with anti-epileptic drugs. If someone has a single self-aborting seizure, they may not actually require anti-epileptic drug, but if they continuously have seizures, they may require short-term treatment. So this is always a bit tricky to sort of determine what is a single self-aborting seizure goes away. When do we start treatment? Uh, this comes up often, but just to remember that you don't need to treat them prophylactically, and then you may not need to treat everybody acutely. So back to our patient. Um, so neurosurgery was consulted. She was started on full dose daltaparin, and something what sometimes what we do is we divide the dose. And she was, she was started on anti-seizure medication. So she received a continuous EEG. She was continued to have seizures. She was loaded with Keppra. Because of her LOC, we did consult ICU. They felt she was fine in terms of protecting her airway and didn't need to go to the ICU, but was kept in our level two unit. We consulted interventional and we discussed with them and they were willing to consider taking the patient, we presented the evidence to the family and they wished to, at the time, continue with anticoagulation and that and not pursue neurointerventional at the time. She continued to have increasing edema. So sometimes with these types of situations, you would use your protocols for um, dealing with cerebral edema. So we gave her hypertonic saline. She got more. AEDs, and she really did not improve, unfortunately. Uh, we did get an MRI. So some people will do, MRI is useful because you can see things that you may not see on the CT. So you can see that this is the hemorrhage that you can see. And then you see um, there is some diffusion restriction, but that's because of the hemorrhage, but you see this extensive edema and it's by hemispheric. So Unfortunately, starting out, this patient had a very poor prognosis. Um, she did not clinically improve. And oh, after several weeks, the we, a discussion was had with the family and she was uh, transitioned to comfort care. So this is probably one of the worst CVT cases I've ever seen. So really quite um, unfortunate and no clear cause why she had it. But I, I am suspicious, you know, that she had some hypercoagulable condition given her previous history. So moving on to case two. So this is another, I had sort of a, a flurry of these patients that I saw within a month. Um, this was a 20 year old um, female that I actually saw in the TIA clinic after the diagnosis was made. She was presenting with approximately four week history of headaches, visual changes, some vague symptoms, she felt dizzy. Um, initially, they thought she had sinusitis. So this is the type of patient where you really need to consider CVT. Um, and then she started having visual changes sort of later in the presentation, uh, which she complained of visual obscurations, blurring of her vision, and maybe some um, diplopia. So because of these visual changes, she was seen by a local optometrist and she was found to have bilateral optic disc swelling, which was quite severe. With this finding, she was sent to the local emergency department. Um, at the time, they were thinking uh, of a condition called idiopathic intracranial hypertension and did a lumbar puncture, which had an elevated opening pressure. 
They did a CT scan and then they did an MRI and MRV. So her uh, past medical history, she was slightly um, overweight. So elevated BMI, she had ADHD. She was on the oral contraceptive pill, risperidone and methylphenidate. So um, when we grade optic disc edema, it's from zero to five. So this is the most severe optic disc edema that this woman unfortunately had. She had disc hemorrhages and cotton wool spots. Um, her neurologic exam when I saw her was normal. There was findings um, of esotropia or um, she, she definitely had ocular misalignment as well when she was seen by neuro-ophthalmology. And she had enlarged blind spots bilaterally. And this is not uncommon with papilledema. So something important to try to examine when you're seeing patients where you suspect CVT. So this CT head was actually reported as normal. Um, does anybody see anything abnormal on this scan? You can put it in the chat. So thank you, Tay. So dense triangle sign. So this is thrombus. Okay. So dense delta. So this is, you know, your superior sagittal sinus and where they kind of the confluence. So this was not reported. Um, but when I went back retrospectively and looked at it, it was there. So there's this dense delta and there's an empty delta, which you can see here. So she had a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. And because of the paramagnetic qualities of blood, um, you can also see it nicely on the DWI, it comes out as black here. Okay, so question number two, how would you manage this patient? Um, so this patient actually came to me already managed, so it's a bit artificial. Um, so what would you do? Would you start her on low molecular weight heparin with a plan to transition to warfarin? Would you start a direct oral anticoagulant per VTE dosing and acetazolamide for intracranial hypertension? Would you start a DOAC per VTE dosing? Would you start low molecular heparin with plan to transition to warfarin and acetazolamide, or would you just start warfarin? Yeah, she is an outpatient, right? So she's she's actually not admitted to hospital. She she the the call was placed to actually thrombosis from the neuro ophthalmology clinic. Okay, so I see two, three, four, all over the place, which is great. Uh, so great um, great choices, and again, somewhat unclear because of lacking uh, evidence. Okay, so what was done? So this was, as I said, um, started by the thrombosis uh, clinic, and they actually started her on a DOAC. So they use VTE dosing. So they 10 milligrams BID for the first two weeks, then five milligrams PO BID. And yes, important to treat the, the papilledema, the venous hypertension. So acetazolamide was started by neuro-ophthalmology. So next thing, what is the evidence for DOAX and CBT? Because people are using them. <laughs> um, do we have actually evidence? So we have a couple of studies. So RESPECT CBT was a randomized control study comparing to Bigotrin and Warfarin. Small study, only 120 patients they found in terms of efficacy, similar um, efficacy um, and between dib dibigatran and warfarin. It was underpowered really to look at complications or major hemorrhage in that. Einstein Jr. is a, a pediatric study where they looked at river roxaban versus standard anticoagulants. And a lot of the standard anticoagulation was heparins um, at three months. And again, Rivaroxaban appeared to be safe and effective. Small trial, I think this was 
Turkish, looking at river rocks of N versus warfarin, similar finding. The one study that we're excited about is the secret trial that uh, we participated in, or a number of Canadian centers participated in, and this is looking at river rocks of N versus standard anticoagulants. And also an exciting trial because they're looking at a lot of patient uh, related outcomes and cognition and things that we haven't really looked at in a trial for CBT. Uh, and then there's one large retrospective ob observational study that I'm going to talk to you about, which is Action CVT. And then there is a, another study, which is called DOAC CVT. And I think we should hope for results in 2024. So what was the Action CVT study? So this was a multi-center retrospective study in the United States, Europe, and New Zealand. Uh, they looked at, I think it was a four years, they collected patients who were admitted to hospital. So these were hospital patients. So moderate CBT, uh, 1,000 patients, over 1,000 with a diagnosis of CBT. So that was their initial sample. And then after, uh, based on you know completion of records and follow-up, they had 845 patients, a young population, which, I, which is consistent with the disease. So 44.8 uh, years and mostly female. So 33% received a DOAC. So this was at the discretion of the investigator. Um, and also the majority of patients were first treated with heparin, a heparin. So low molecular weight or unfractionated heparin. 51.8% um, patients got warfarin and then some of them got both. So they started on warfarin and then they were switched to a DOAC. And the median duration of follow-up was six months, and they, their follow-up rate was about 85%, so not 100%. So again, this there is limitations to the study because it is a retrospective chart review. And what they found when they compared DOACs to warfarin, that there was a similar recurrent risk of venous thrombosis at six months. Um, so between C, so their venous thrombosis risk also included DVT and PE. Uh, similar risk of uh, mortality, similar uh, recanalization, and lower major risk with uh, DOACs, and that's consistent what we know uh, about DOACs and the VTE and the uh, atrial fibrillation literature. So again, this is not a randomized control study, but it's a fairly well-conducted um, study you know, retrospective in nature with a large population size. So people are using DOACs and we can, you know, talk about this. Um, so even though we don't um, have, you know, huge randomized controlled trials, uh, DOACs are being used in practice. So one thing that's really important to consider in this in, and what um, the case that I showed you isolated was the threat of vision loss. So this is you know, potentially uh, a long-term consequence, consequence that does not improve, right? So what is the, you know, visual changes? So visual changes could mean many different things. So at least in the Venus study, which is one of the larger uh, CVT studies, 26.5% had some uh, description of visual changes. And do we actually know how many patients with CVT present with papilledema? Again, not every patient with, every patient should have a fundoscopy exam um, who have CVT, but we don't have excellent literature, literature on this. So it's not perfectly, or I'd say it's poorly described. So is it, you know, between 30 to 40%? I don't think we really know what the true number is here. So it can lead to permanent and severe visual loss if not identified early. The pattern is usually bilateral. So that was the case with our young woman. And patients can present with blurry vision, diplopia, photophobia, visual obscuration. So where they're sort of missing parts of their vision. Um, so those are the things to ask, you know, with anybody who's presenting with a, an acute or new headache. And it highlights the importance of have, looking at the fun, fundi, okay? Again, there's not a lot of great um, studies, but this is a study from 2020 and it's a multi-chart review. Um, from the states, and they looked at seven neuro-ophthalmology clinics. It was over a nine-year period, so it's quite a long uh, time to collect these patients. So they found 65 patients who had um, 
CBT. And out of those patients, 54%, so that's higher than the percentages I showed you were diagnosed with papilledema at onset. And this just shows you that it is dynamic, that 46% um, presented later with this. So the Friesen score is the score I told you about from zero to five. So the median was 2.7 in 33 patients. And actually, sorry, in 33 patients, they actually had a grade greater than three. So that's pretty high. That's, you know, like a fairly high number of patients who had, you know, moderate to severe papilledema. It highlights the delay that sometimes it can take to make this diagnosis in these patients, highlighting that the difficulty and the challenge sometimes of making a CVT diagnosis. And also, as I said, the dynamic nature that it actually worsened in a number of patients over 59 days. And when they looked at, um, you know, what was the permanent effect was that visual acuity was 20 out of 25 and 26% had visual field loss at six months. So that, you know, not everybody, this doesn't resolve in everybody. So what were the risk factors for visual field loss at final assessment were the grade and papilledema progression. So what do, what are some things to consider? So everybody should be examined um, for this. It is very challenging sometimes in the sickest patients like the patient we saw. I did try to examine her eyes the next day and um, it was, it's challenging, right? We all know that, but we should attempt that. If we're not sure, we should get an expert. So all patients preferably should have an ophthalmology or optometrist assessment, ideally within the 24 to 48 hours if they have visual assessments or signs of increased ICP. Ideally within seven days of no visual symptoms. And this is what we recommend or, or what, what ophthalmology recommends, visual acuity, color vision, dilated fun fundus and automated parametry. Most patients, if they have papilledema are treated with acetazolamide. The evidence we have is derived from you know, the IIH trials. And it's really important to ensure appropriate and timely follow-up. So with these patients, you know, because I showed you that they do progress, you know, in the ideal world, you may want to actually ensure they have a follow-up if they didn't have papilledema within you know, two weeks, three weeks. Is that possible in our, our, our clinical care setting? Not always. Again, we don't have amazing evidence for this, um, when to follow patients. And the one thing is there are more, I guess, invasive treatments if the papilledema does not resolve, such as optic nerve sheath fenestration or shunting um, if the patient's papilledema is not improving with medical management. Okay. So what is the optimal duration of anticoagulation? So that will depend on the etiology, whether it was provoked versus unprovoked, if it's a transient versus a permanent risk factor. We don't really know what the optimal duration is. Um, so there is a study that's forthcoming that will look at this. At minimum, I recommend three months and up to six months. Sometimes I, in the, the, the importance is that you work with your thrombosis colleagues. I often work with them to treat this. And in some patients may require lifelong if they have uh, hereditary thrombophilia um, or other risk factors that um, would uh, predispose them to having recurrent uh, CBT. So I typically treat for six months. If I have a patient who I'm following up with imaging, I usually follow up at three months. If it's completely recanalized at three months and they're no longer having symptoms, I may stop the anticoagulation then, but usually I treat for six months. And imaging can sometimes guide you, but not always because there's a large proportion of patients who never completely recanalize. And we're still trying to understand um, how that relates to duration of anticoagulation and long-term prognosis. So there are special populations. I, I don't have time to go into them, but antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is one of them that, you know, if you have triple positive, so that means you have all the antibodies you should not be treated with a DOAC. These are patients that need warfarin, hereditary thrombophilias, pregnancy, purpurium, and future pregnancy. Um, usually patients during pregnancy receive low molecular weight heparin, and then they are usually prophylactically treated. Head trauma, infection, cancer, and then one condition that you've probably heard about is VIT, uh, which is the vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia with the CHADOX 
the adenovirus vaccines for COVID. So I'll just spend very shortly some time on this because this was in the press and um, this condition, um, you know, back in 2021. So to have a definitive diagnosis, uh, you had to receive the COVID vaccine within four to 42 days. And then the you needed um, all five criteria for a definitive diagnosis, venous or arterial thrombus, thrombocytopenia, and then you had to have a positive uh, PF4 hit assay and markedly elevated D-dimer. So this was a very, you know, interesting condition because basically, you know, um, physicians and scientists were working in the moment to figure out what the ideal treatment was. So do not use heparin. IVIG and non-heparin anticoagulation is recommended, and aspirin and platelet transfusions are contraindicated. So this is a paper that came out recently uh, looking at the experience of this condition, and there was, I think, seven patients from Canada in this study. And just to highlight a couple of things that you can, you can kind of see how mortality decreased as the disease was better understood and the treatment was understood. Um, that initially, you know, there was higher mortality. And this also shows, you know, if heparins at any time are used, adequate immodul immunomodulation and platelet transfusion, that it changed as less, you know, for instance, heparins were used and also just with experience. And it seems that immunomodulation uh, seemed to be um, sort of affected the odds ratio most significantly for mortality in patients with CVT. So if you followed all the recommendations, um, that was your adjusted odds ratio, but if immo immunomodulation was just used, that was the most significant treatment. And then the one thing to highlight is that mortality from this condition was much higher than mortality um, in standard CVT. I'm just going to for time's sake, I'm going to skip this uh, regarding COVID. And then I just want to highlight a couple of points. So, you know, with any stroke patient, you want to uh, consider cognition in the long-term sequelae, which are not well studied, but it is reported. Remember, these are often young individuals um, in the prime of their, you know, working life, family life, and they have this condition, even though the prognosis is good, there is still a significant proportion of patients who don't fully recover. So depression, anxiety, fatigue are common. Things that you need to address is return to work and life. I don't have time to go into this, but it's not uncommon that I'm managing headaches, seizures, fatigue. So you need to, to, to be very um, cognizant of these potential complications. And one thing to remember is that even though their imaging may improve, it doesn't mean that the patients don't have chronic symptoms, right? So we're still understanding, uh, get, gaining more understanding of this disease. So what's next and CVT? So as I told you, the secret study should be presented. Uh, it's finished with its last follow-up. So analysis is underway. So results should be forthcoming in 2023. Trying to answer the duration of anticoagulation. Um, that's another study. So looking at three to six months versus 12 months, and they're looking at recurrence and safety. And then there's some interesting studies looking at whether there's, you know, certain individuals who are more predisposed based on their genetic makeup. And I think vision changes, you know, understanding that better. Um, and that, you know, Thalia Field is interested in looking at this population and examining the question of, you know, vision changes in patients with CDT in a more uh, prospective manner. Recanalization status, I think that's also quite interesting. So what, how does, you know, not everybody recanalizes. There's still maybe 30% of patients who don't. And what is the long-term consequences of not recanalizing? And because this disease is rare, we really need to collaborate in the multi-center approach. And the numbers are not large. So it's going to be hard to have, you're never going to have the same type of studies as we do in ischemic stroke. So this is just highlighting, this is just my cartoon with multidisciplinary approach and the different specialties and the patient. 
you know, you have your obstetricians, you have your ophthalmologist, your hematologist, and your neurologist, and just everybody needs to work together. This is a multidisciplinary um, disease, and it's rare. So, you know, you need to consult the the experts, right? So that's my sort of telemedicine cartoon. So just to summarize, um, it's an important diagnosis to consider, especially, you know, in a young woman with new or different headache, especially when they have visual symptoms. Acute medical management typically involves acute anticoagulation with heparin. So usually in a hospitalized patient who is unwell, you're not going to start them on a DOAC. We're, we're typically treating with heparin and transitioning to either a warfarin or DOAC. So the DOAC treatment is out the door. People are treating with DOACs. So they appear to be set effective and safe at least for the, you know, longer term management or the management of patients who are, you know, presenting to the eMERGE who are not as sick and may just have a headache and can be discharged home. But you have to remember the cost, the insurance coverage, and, and, and they're not necessarily covered, right? And then also the special populations I talked to you about where DOACs may not be appropriate. We still are not clear what the optimal duration of anticoagulation is. Uh, is uh, we're, not, we're not entirely clear. Is it six months, a year, permanent vision loss is a risk. So please always consider this when you're seeing these patients. And also really important to consider, as you always do in all stroke patients, um, the long-term sequelae, right? So it's, it's not uncommon that these individuals do have fatigue, cognitive issues, headache, and seizure. So that's it for me. And thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Manzia. And uh, right now I'd like to invite anyone that has questions, you can drop them in the chat if you like, or um, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, there is one question in the chat already. So, and it was back when you were talking about the vision piece, uh, it came into the chat. So what vision, what visual test tool should patients use when they go home to monitor their vision? Uh, the grid design, question mark, visual acuity, uh, Snell and mini chart, et cetera. Do you have any recommendations or? Would... That's a great question. Um, I, I'm not sure if we know that answer. I think it's really more based on symptoms, right? I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, a, a, a very sort of astute patient will go home and maybe look at a Snell and chart in that. Um, but we don't routinely give out Snell and chart. So I think it's really symptoms, right? So you need to counsel based on symptoms, if they're developing any blurry vision, double vision, all the all the symptoms I told you about worsening headaches. Um, those are things to look at. But that's a, you know, that's a good, good idea. Um, and an interesting study question to look at, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions, I just had a question and maybe I missed it, um, just about the incidence of CVT in the population. So I know it kind of came to the forefront with the, obviously when COVID and it was very public, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 what I showed you was about, so 1% of strokes. Um, I think it's, I've seen different, like a hundred thousand. So it's, it, it's probably more than we know, um, but not um, as com like less com definitely less common than ischemic stroke and 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 that. So yeah. Okay, great. And I see that Ravinder um, has a hand up, so you can come off mute. Yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. Mandia. It's a wonderful presentation. I would say it's a great summary uh, and a good reminder that uh, younger patient needs. Uh, at least uh, a thought when they come into the eMERGE. A lot of patients, uh, young patients, they come with headache and a lot of times the CVT diagnosis gets missed, uh, especially if there is no parent camel change. So it's a good reminder that uh, we should definitely look at the venous sinuses and cortical veins. And actually we recently had a couple of patients uh, uh, where the scan was reported normal and uh, and patient had CV, uh, CVT. So my question about the case was uh, that patient had a lot of white matter changes. Largely this was vasogenic. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think it was the raised ICP and was any um, consideration for bifrontal craniotomy done? Because sometimes these patients, once you decompress them, uh, they tend to 
quickly uh, rebound in terms of their level of consciousness. So mm -hmm. was there was that a discussion or? Yeah, so we 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 did. I, I wasn't involved in the initial you know admission, but we did talk. I think neurosurgery was actually um, consulted first because of the hemorrhage. Um, and they were not keen to go and uh, operate on this patient and decompress or just do bifrontal, as you said, craniectomy um, for ICP management. I think always the thing that comes up and the concern is the hemorrhage and then the patient on the anti on anticoagulation. So uh, they they do get concerned uh, about that. This this case, you know, still kind of. I think about it a bit, you know, should I push more for interventional? I don't know if that would be helpful because there's just such, what do you pick? <laughs> there's like so much sinus involved, right? So much disease in that. And the fact that she already had these hemorrhages, um, but that's a great point, Ravi. Um, but, so neurosurgery was consulted, but I don't believe the initial consult did consider that. And they were quite nervous about doing um, any sort of OR on the patient. Thank you. No, and I see um, Pat has her hand up, so over to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to take my hand down so I don't forget. Uh, great presentation, Dr. Mancia. I'm wondering, is there any idea to uh, go back and uh, start again on the ACT CVT trial? Because the information from that might really help us understand how to manage. It's always the the obscure that becomes a challenge to manage in, in clinical care. So I wondered if, if there's been any thought about that and also were Canadian sites involved in that or, or what were the sites involved? So the, the DOAC, the retrospective review? Yeah, so there was no Canadian sites. It was American, right? I think, oh. I, I, are you talking about secret? Which one are you talking about? No, the very first case, I yeah. think the study was called ACT CVT, unless I can't read my own handwriting, which would be embarrassing. Okay. I just want to see which it. Was, yeah, you said it was stopped early. Because oh, sorry, the TOAC, the TOAC yes. study, yes. TOAC, I, okay. Yeah, I don't know if there's going to be, there was no Canadian sites. It was um, Dutch, Europe, yeah, primarily European okay. sites. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's going to be, I feel like there's not going to be another study. I mean, maybe there will be. The problem is it's rare, right? So right. It took, I think this study took four or five years and then it was terminated prematurely. So I don't know if we're ever gonna get a new site, right? A, a okay. new study, uh, but I still think the question is not completely clear, right? Because of I think there probably are patients who may benefit. And I think it's just unclear how long you wait to see if anticoagulation works. You For know. Sure. And, in, in retrospect, maybe this patient should have had this, right? You know, and would it have made a difference? Um, I don't know. I don't know if it would. I think it was already, she had many poor prognostic signs to start with, right? But I don't think there, there is going to be a Canadian study as far as I know. But I think this question is still not answered. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. And I might take the opportunity to just answer the question about oral contraceptives. Uh, over the last 30 years, uh, as a far, uh, I'm a pharmacist by training, the amount of estrogen has been lowered in many oral contraceptives. So we, we do think that the risk of uh, stroke is lower because they are lower. But it also is really key to understand if women smoke while they're on oral contraceptives because we know that that changes the the risk and I think it changes it exponentially I can't remember for sure thanks so much yeah and I, I'd say sometimes with the OCP sometimes it's the only thing but it's also women who are have an elevated BMI I find that those are the comp the combo that often is the only thing we we see that is the causal factor um I think Alexander Kaw has a comment. Um, no RCT. Oh, maybe he's talking about the craniectomy. Yes, yeah, there is a study that, that hasn't been published yet, as far as I can find the Jose Ferro, Ferro study looking at decompressive craniectomy. I only found it in abstract form. So um, thanks, Dr. Kaw, for pointing that out. Uh, for for showing decreased mortality 
uh, and better outcomes, but still not actually published for some reason. Great, and that brings us right to nine o'clock. There was one uh, last small question that you can probably answer just before we uh, get off, but has there been a change in CVT with the change in the oral contraceptives I over think, the past number of years? I think Pat, I, I don't, I off the top of my head, I don't know. And I, I think it probably isn't. I think we're probably better at diagnosing, right? We're more aware of the condition. So it's going to be hard to, to disentangle that question, right? Because yeah. we're diagnosing this condition more. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the, the answer to that. I'd have to look it up. So I want to thank you uh, so much, Dr. Manzia, for coming to present to the province today at Provincial Stroke Rounds. It's been a pleasure to have you here. I'll remind people um, to please take a couple of minutes and fill out the evaluation. The link was dropped into the chat and it's uh, on the poster and all the materials that are associated with the event. The next Provincial Stroke Rounds will be hosted on Wednesday, February the 1st. 2023 in the new year, and the Champlain Regional Stroke Network will be presenting. So I hope you can join us at that time. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks, Jane. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody.